My name is Thor Edvardsen, I'm from Oslo in Norway, I'm the president-elect of EACVI. And I'm here in uh, Lisbon at the Euroeco Imaging 2017 in Portugal with my good friend and colleague Tom Marvik. He is a professor of the Baker, uh, the, the Baker Heart and Diabetic Institute in Melbourne in, in Australia. And, and he's also an editor in Jack and Jack Imaging. So he will know all the new stuff in the imaging area from that perspective as well as a clinician. So Tom, the topic for today is new technical development in imaging and we're going to discuss some of the most important changes and, and progress and, uh, advance, uh, um, and advances in clinical practice. Mm -hmm. What does matter for the patients? So if we start with the last decade and mm -hmm. then move on to the future. Mm -hmm. So what, what would you um, say is the most important progress that happened the last decade in yeah. imaging? It's an interesting question, Tor. I mean, I think inherently it's subjective, isn't it? You, you perceive right. relative importance from what you do. From my standpoint, I think strain has been an incredible development. I mean, every so often we've seen uh, new post-processing things which haven't progressed. And strain, you know, is now well past a decade in use and, and beginning to become very important clinically, at least in our practice. I, I presume the same is true in your part of the sure, world. We have, we have used it for many years. Yeah. And also the sonographers, they, they analy analyze the strain Yeah, I, th I think it's one of those things that um, you know, really works well if you incorporate it into your practice rather than doing it uh, occasionally. But you must be very interested in strain because the threshold to learn it is, is quite high. Do you agree? I, well, I mean, like all imaging, there is a learning curve. Um, but in fact, I think that the learning curve for strain is probably less in some senses than some other things that we've picked up in the past. I mean, if we go back uh, a few decades, um, the changes that came with introducing transesophageal echo or even color flow Doppler going further back, they were very significant learning processes. Um, mm. And strain, I think, has been possibly you know, less of a major thing than that has, although there's clearly a learning curve, I agree with that. So what is your impression? You have been working in, uh, at the Cleveland Institute, mm. now you're back in Australia. Mm. Do they use these techniques all over U US and Australia as well? I, I think so. I think people at different places use them to different degrees. But let's face it, the thing that is driving the use of strain is that um, epidemiologically there's a change in heart failure from heart failure with reduced ejection to fraction to preserved ejection fraction and and really uh, strain has been a very useful tool for that transition. Yeah, I read your paper in um, uh, it was the European Journal of Heart Failure where you studied asymptomatic mm. patients with mm. stage B yeah. heart failure yeah. and you could predict by strain you can improve the prediction yeah. on how it went with the patients. Yeah, so I think, you know, we, we know that there's a phase before people become symptomatic, um, that uh, they're kind of at the top of the cliff, and I think we hope that by intervening earlier we may prevent the progression to, to heart failure. Now, the latter part of that I think needs to be proven, but I think we are better able to stratify their risk. Do you really think that echocardiography is, is a tool to screen people yeah. before they get really sick? I, I, I do. I mean, ideally, we would do it with some sort of biomarker. Um, but at the moment, I don't think we have the right tool. Um, and I think the thing that we need to keep in mind with echo, in fact, you could put it down as another of the developments for the last decade, has been the development of the handheld. Uh, you know, we've been beneficiaries of the process of automation and miniaturization. And so what we do now for strain on a full-size machine, in five or 10 years time, will we do it on a handheld? Quite conceivably so. Mm. So if that were the case, then, then yes, maybe it would be possible to use an imaging approach to identify people at risk in primary care. So what will happen to strain measurements the next few years from now? Do you know? Do you have any idea? 
Um, well, I, I mean, uh, you know, obviously the thing that is happening at the moment is the question of whether we should transition from 2D to 3D strain. And I think the attraction of that is um, that we lose speckles coming out of plane in 2D and we don't have that problem in 3D. I think the disadvantage is that there's obviously a cost in terms of temporal and spatial resolution with moving to 3D. And there's, there's a lot of ambiguity and disagreement in the literature as to whether we should be using 3D or we should, should still be using 2D. So I think that we need to work through that. But I think in addition to the whole strain um, story, there's also a story about how we use ECHO to plan for structural heart disease interventions and do measurements of, for example, volumes in a way that we've just used dimensions before. I think that's been a huge change in the last decade. Mm. If you return to the handheld uh, mm. machines, uh, what is your opinion? Should every physician have one instead of the stethoscope? Yeah, so I think this is a, this is a fundamental question about handheld as to whether it's a stethoscope replacement or uh, whether it's something that perhaps we might use as echocardiographers to judge who should go on to having a full echo. And I think the challenge with it being used as a stethoscope replacement is that there are many people in cardiology who last did an echocardiogram, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. And the prospect of getting them to go back to, do, to using echo again is something very unfamiliar for them. But I'm, I'm very attracted to this idea that we would use a handheld or a lower level device to satisfy uh, simple questions from a referring clinician in a way that are not well captured by the appropriate use criteria. Um, you know, doctors ask for tests because there's some clinical ambiguity um, and, uh, you know, preventing them from doing them because of the appropriate use criteria is probably not a good solution. But maybe we could provide the information that they want from a simple handheld test without the patient coming to the echo lab. Like a quick test? Yeah, exactly. Bedside? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Th there are some debates, at least in, in Europe. Mm if you should allow other specialities yeah. to use the handle yeah. equipment. Yeah. What, what is your opinion about that? I, I look, I agree there are debates across the world. I, I think the issue is really the level of expertise. I, I, I'm not so worried about the label that people carry. The, the, the question is, or the fear is, I suppose, that if somebody who's less expert uses the device and then fails to recognize something, you know, misleading information is worse than no information at all. Absolutely. Yeah. Some words about interventional echocardiography. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned it, and uh, I, I think this, this, I, I think this is going to be a growth area for echo in years to come. And again, I think as as imagers, it's a place where we will have an ongoing role. You know, the interventionist is busy doing other things in the cath lab with these interventions. Often, the interventionist is required and. I think the history of this is that we, uh, as, as imagers, have invested a lot of time into this and likely will continue to do so in the future as interventions become progressively less invasive. So thank you, Tom. Thank you for thank the you discussion. Tom. Thank you for coming. Nice to thank see you. you.